contest is 1 Corinthians 1. Uh, Paul says, Chloe's family told us that there's some divisions among you folks, and uh, we're going to be doing the last half of the chapter by, the end of, uh, by today, having to do with the, the roots of division. Division is more than somebody has a squabble, somebody's been hurt, somebody has a complaint against somebody else. That's the manifestation of it. But there are deeper roots to division. We're going to look at those today. Um, chapter 2 has to do with the engines that drive unity and division in the church. Uh, it'll be chapter 2. Chapter 3 has to do with uh, leaders in the church that either leaders and teachers that promote unity or promote division. That's chapter 3. So we will get there. Oh, by the way, next Sunday will be awesome. I, I just, God's going to be doing a good thing here. Today, Christ God's power and wisdom. Christ, God's power and wisdom. If you could picture with me, uh, I want to give you a little analogy, So, and because uh, what I'm going to teach is really too big to say today. There's too much to it. I nearly killed myself this week trying to get here. I cut out more than you're going to get. So uh, if you could picture, there's, there's what's called the Great Divide, the Continental Divide. It actually starts up at the very peak of Alaska up at the Arctic up there, runs down through Canada, through the United States, through Central America, down through South America, and ends up down at the very point of Argentina uh, at uh, the Antarctic. So here's this long nonstop chain that weaves its way along. It's the highest ridges in the world that make up a divide. And what the divide is, is the rainwater, the waterfall, flows east and out to the Atlantic Ocean, ultimately, on the east side of the Rockies and on the east side of the divide, and west of the Pacific on the west side, left side. So it's, uh, and I want to use that analogy because there's division in the church. I'm going to use the idea of this ridge, very high ridge, that divides two camps of people. On the one side, there's a flow. And uh, that's the flesh camp. Let's put that on the east side just because we pushed west. But uh, I'm, I'm not so happy with the west side of the mountains now, but we'll go ahead and <laughs> not worry about politics. Okay, so the east side of the ridge, the Rockies, is this camp of people that, uh, that they, they uh, see things one way. And, and you'll see in just a minute, God says, you're seeing that, but it's not that. You think this, but it's not this. And there are people that uh, want what anybody wants. They, they want the grace of God. They want the power of God. They want the wisdom of God. But they're over here, and they're not getting the flow. They're not getting God's flow on this side of the ridge. And they want it. And on the other side is a second camp. And this is the camp of people that are uh, spirit-led, spirit-filled, they're, they're just uh, spirit people on the left side. So you have the carnal camp on the, the east side, you have the spirit camp on the left side, and these are people that climbed over the ridge, got over the ridge, and now they are uh, uh, able to see things as they are. Uh, they're, they're not, they don't have anything false, they don't have any fake, anything fake. On the east side, uh, it's like they, they, they're looking for nutrition, but all they can do is chew cardboard. There's, everything's empty. Everything's hollow. Everything's not what it ought to be. On the other side is the gold. On the other side is uh, the authentic, the real, the genuine. And the only way over the ridge, the ridge is uh, the cross of Christ. The ridge that separates the two is... Uh, the cross of Christ, number one, and the Holy Spirit that relationally gets that cross applied, gets it applied in our lives. Because the cross is the place that separated flesh and spirit. The cross is the divider. Now, it doesn't have to divide because we could all be moving with the Spirit. But for those that don't want to move with the Spirit of God, they get separated out because they don't want to go through the cross. And we'll see in a second, the cross is the power of God. Yeah. And what that means is, for some people, the cross is a religious symbol. But for us, 
We've been there. Power means the ability of God, the working of God, the operational uh, uh, effectiveness of God. And so the cross is, we can point to it and say, you think that's a symbol? I died there. Something happened. It changed me. The old went away. The new has come. It happened at that place. You see that? You, you don't know. That is the power of God there. That's where God gets things done. And so that ridge is, people are trying to figure some other pass. There's got to be another pass, another way, other than Jesus himself or his cross. There's got to be a different way over into this land where the provision is real. It's not cardboard. It's true. And, uh, and they want to get there because they, they want the benefits. But uh, the only way over that pass is Christ and what he did for us at the cross. And the Holy Spirit getting all of that implemented into us. Uh, so that's kind of the context. Isn't that cool? Yeah. I think that's cool. <laughs> Christ, God's wisdom and power. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18. We're going to go through the last part of uh, 1 Corinthians here. It says for. And when you see for, it means in, in view of the fact. It's, it's because of. So it's connecting previous thoughts with what's going to follow. Uh, the previous thoughts had to do with division in the church, had to do with uh, things that Chloe's family had reported. Uh, it says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. So immediately he begins to talk about mindset and perspective. They look at the cross and they go, That's stupid. The word foolishness means absurdity, dullness, stupidity, silliness, moronic, nonsense. So uh, uh, their minds cannot register what that is. And it, to them it's nonsense. But to us who are being saved, and the word sozo means healed, made well, made whole, receiving the benefits to us who are being saved, it is the, say it with me, it is the power of God. That's where it all happened. Power meaning ability uh, to perform, ability to accomplish, miraculous activities. Verse 19, for it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. Now that doesn't sound like God, does it? Oh, just want to wipe out wisdom in wise people. And, and you need to understand, he's going to be saying things tongue-in-cheek throughout this chapter. He's using the world's language to try to talk to it. He says, I'm going to destroy the wisdom, you could put apostrophes around those, because it really isn't, of the wise, because they're really not, and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent, but that's on the world's level. That's, that's the world's definition of things. You, uh, in man's world, they're called wisdom, prudence, understanding. But they aren't that in God's world. And it's just not true. They're wise. They're, no, he's going to destroy the fake. He's going to destroy the false. The division will make apparent what's counterfeit. See, what God's doing with the Corinthian church, all the struggles they were having between each other, it's because there were certain basic things wrong down underneath the surface in their roots. And he's going to, God has to, for their sake, because they're caught up with his perception that's not true. And, and it's affecting all their relationships. He's going to separate the counterfeit from what's real. He says, this is what you call wisdom, and here's true wisdom. See the difference? He's trying to help the Corinthian church out of their divisiveness, but their unity is going to come from the truth and the Spirit of God working in them. And he said, the wisdom, prudence, uh, understanding that, that is defined by the world as such, I will destroy. I will destroy it. He's not saying he's going to destroy anything good. What he's in effect saying is, I'm going to destroy the lie. I'm going to get the lie out of your life so that you don't have to be stuck on the wrong side of the mountain. Where is the wise? Again, apostrophes in world's terms. I'll show you in a second. Where, where is the scribe? See, I told you there's a lot. 
what I want to teach today, just, I won't tell you what this week was like. Where is the disputer of this age? Not the wise in God, not the, has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? It never was wise, the wisdom of the world. Never was wise. We just thought it was. All the experts think it is. Uh, never was wise, always was foolish. It just always was. Just we didn't know it. We didn't see it because of our mindset. We were stuck in the wrong camp. Now, technically, we're all taken over the ridge. And we're all on the spirit camp. But many Christians, including, and this is progressive. You don't just leap over the top of that ridge, you know, in a single stride. Uh, this is something that we grow into by receiving more of the spirit's influence and less of the flesh's. And we're all growing in that. Verse 21, since in the wisdom of God, so this is the right kind of wisdom, the spiritual mind grasping spiritual wisdom. The world through wisdom. There, he's using the same words, but this isn't the same wor- wisdom he just talked about. He says the wisdom of God. Now the world through its wisdom did not know God. In other words, through the naturalness of the world's wisdom, they could not gain the spiritual knowledge of God. Not possible. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Spirit gives birth to spirit. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message. Can you hear what he's doing here? It's not a foolish message. Why is he using the word foolish? Because that's the way it looks to the world's perspective. He's talking tongue-in-cheek. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Is he really saying the message of the cross is in any way foolish? No. It's the flesh's evaluation is a wrong evaluation of a truly brilliant, masterful concept, an idea. Verse 22, for Jews request a sign. Anybody else here want to see a miracle? I, I, I'm not uh, pursuing spiritual power, but from a natural position. They want God to work. Who wouldn't? The Greeks seek after wisdom, pursuing spiritual wisdom, but from a natural mind. Now, these two words, they're coupled together several times in the Bible. Wisdom and power. Wisdom, and power. wisdom is knowing what to do and how to do it. Power is the ability to do it. Knowing what to do. Wouldn't you like to know what to do, how to do it? Power is the ability to get what you know done and accomplished. In other words, with wisdom and power combined, you can accomplish anything. Anything. Spiritual wisdom and power, you can accomplish anything in the kingdom. But on earth, people want wisdom and power too. Because they know what to do, and then they can do it. So Jews and Greeks, the religious mind, the secular mind, chased after wisdom and power. The natural mind does. Verse 23, but we preached Christ crucified. It's interesting. They are chasing wisdom and power, wisdom and power, wisdom and power. And he doesn't say, but we're chasing God's wisdom and power. He doesn't say that. He says, we preach Christ crucified crucified they chase this and what's the alternative we're preaching this to the Jews a stumbling block to the Greeks foolishness this is the way they saw it they had no access to it Jews would trip over it Greeks wouldn't recognize it verse 24 but to those who are called both Jews and Greeks All of a sudden, it wipes out the whole differentiation between the two. Christ, the power of 
God and wisdom of God. It's not just that I've always seen Jesus as throwing something my way. Handing me something. Here, I'll give you wisdom. Here, I'll give you power. Here, have some. It's not what it's saying here. Christ, the power of God. Christ, the power of God. And the wisdom of God. See, I think, and, and it's an amazing idea for me, but at the center of all existence, anywhere, spiritual, across the galaxies, whatever, any existence, at the very center of existence is not a machine, not an organization, not a bunch of angels. It's one person. It's a person. He doesn't get power. He is it. He doesn't get wisdom. He is it. Isn't that amazing? You get at the core of everything, and there stands Jesus. I want to know him better. Wisdom, as we know Jesus, the person, better, while they're chasing wisdom, I'm getting to know Jesus, and wisdom comes to me. It's almost a surprise. It's almost like these signs follow you. You know, they're just kind of like you're just following him and all of a sudden signs are, and, and you're just getting to know Jesus and all of a sudden ideas start going ding, 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 ding. You're looking at a chessboard. You've always, you've never won a chess game. You're looking at the chessboard and the pieces just begin to move in front of your eyes. And you go, what in the world? How does that work? And the power of God as we get, all we're doing is, the focus isn't, I want to have power. The Jews do that. It's, I want to have Jesus. And as we're getting to know Jesus, then all of a sudden we begin to realize, I am now able to do what I couldn't do before. And I can stop doing what I've wanted to stop before, and I wasn't able. But I can now. How did that happen? I don't know. All I know is him. When we know Jesus better, we find out Christ, the power and the wisdom of God. And he said, when he said things, and we read over them, like, I am the way. What is he trying to say? Here, I'll give you a road map. I am. Well, talk to me and, and tell me what I am the way. I am the truth. It's him. It's in him. I, I want life. Well, we expect God's going to drip a couple drops of life on us. I am it. I am it. <laughs> we need to seek Christ as if our lives depend on it because they really do. More than we know. All the Christianity we're trying to live out is Christ dependent. And our window or portal of receptivity to get the spiritual into our natural enlarges or shrinks according to our relationship and fellowship with him. Verse 25, because the foolishness of God, as if there is such a thing, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God, as if there could be a, such a thing, is stronger than men. He just looks weak to the flesh because the flesh does not see accurately. Verse 26, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh. I was so embarrassed by these things. Okay, God's going to take the, 
the non-achieving, untalented, stupid, ugly people <laughs> and really impress all the smart, good-looking people out there. I don't think that's what he getting, he's getting at. He says their mindsets, their perspectives, one's true and one's false. According to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are in the church. Not many mighty. No, that's not saying there's not many mighty in this room. Not many noble. It's saying according to the flesh, in the flesh's definition of things, which is false anyway. Just look that way to fleshy people. Uh, verse 27. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world in the world's eyes, the world's definition. But are they foolish? No. Truly, truly wise. To put to shame the wise in the... So sorry for going back. I didn't know how else to do it today. The wise in the world's way of perceiving things. And God has chosen the weak things of the world in the world's definition of things to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the truly wise... He's saying, and he's helping the Corinthian church because they can't get along with each other and don't know how to stop fighting each other. And he's saying, look, I'm going to sift this out because you guys are trapped with a perception that is killing you. The truly wise, those that really know the Spirit of God, will shame the false wise. That are wise by lying standards. We'll make them blush, expose the truth. That the honor and dignity they carry is not real. That it's all been a lie. And he's not, it's not, I'm going to shame, God doesn't shame people. What he's saying is going to take the lie and he's going to break it. He's going to lift it off of people so we can move. Don't you want to move? Are you tired of chewing guardboard? Are you tired of fussing with things that don't, aren't effective? But to be able as an individual and as a church to move into the spirit realm in an effective way with God, that's what he's going to do for the Corinthians. And give them the ability to get along with each other, which is not, you can fake it outside of Christ, but you can't make it outside of Christ. He's correcting the mindset in the church to show the truth about what's really from God and what's not. Real spirituality and the truth church, real wisdom, real power, vastly superior to false spirituality and false power, and he's going to show the one for being false that enslaves the church. And God's saying, I'm going to free you, folks. That's what he's doing. I'm going to shake out of you the flesh that is causing all the trouble between you. No more earthly stuff. Somebody says, see Pastor Joe? He's not, not Joe the Samoan fellow. See, Pastor Joe, he's so spiritual. Wow, look, he's got wisdom and power. And you look at their hero and their champion in the faith. And this isn't your attitude. You can just see flesh and error dripping and reeking. You know, you just look, okay. Uh, and you're just kind of aghast. That's a, that's a real word, right? Aghast. And uh, you say, I, I see this and they see that. What's wrong with them? Are they crazy? Am I crazy? Who's crazy here? And we're in that kind of moment in our country, a what in the world's going on type of moment. Because either they're crazy or I'm crazy, but somebody for sure is crazy here. <laughs> you know, because there are a couple minds going on here. It's not Trump and Biden. It's a spirit flesh thing going on here. And... Uh, and you look at what they're worshiping as the salvation for mankind, and you're going, that reeks with flesh. Yeah. Verse 28, and the base things of the world and the things which are despised by the world, God has chosen, and the things which are not in the world's definition, to bring to nothing the things that are. God is going to do it through people that appear to be nothing, He's going to use real wise to destroy false wise, not destroy the people, to bring down the foolishness that captivates them. The real strong to overpower the false strong. Real somebodies to make nothing of the false somebodies. And the reason why is in verse 29. I love this. 
Verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. That's why. Verse 30, but of him you are in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom. He didn't just toss out a little wisdom to you. Have an answer. He became for us wisdom from God. Wisdom means you can see it like God sees it. Your thinking clears up. All the craziness disappears. And righteousness. Now, this is sequential. It's progressive. Righteousness has to do with I'm at peace with God. I begin to see like God. I have peace with God, and that's followed up by sanctification, meaning I'm being pulled out of the carnal camp. I'm being placed in the spiritual camp. And redemption, that word, if you think redemption's over, your spirit's been redeemed, that there's a whole lot of you waiting, because redemption has to do with where your body and soul receive what your spirit already has. In other words, he's going to give you right up through redemption where you're actually putting it all on, Jesus is the whole deal from beginning to end. Verse 31, that it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. When it's all over, this is the song we're going to sing. Jesus did it all, not because we're so humble, but because it's going to be so obvious that he did it all. I didn't do this thing. I just got to know him, and then he started doing it. He moved the pieces on the chessboard. Relationship with Christ is the great mother load. When we look past our need, fix our eyes on Jesus, we've just become the richest people on earth. Fellowshipping with Jesus is everything. It's everything. I want to... Well, anyway, I won't get into it. (laughs) Ezekiel 16, verse 6. And when I passed by you... And saw you struggling in your blood. I said to you in your blood, live. This is a baby had been tossed out into the field. Yes, I said to you in your blood, live. Verse 11. I adorned you with ornaments, put bracelets on your wrists and a chain on your neck. And I put a jewel in your nose, earrings in your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. Verse 14 through 15. Your fame went out among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through my splendor which I bestowed on you, says the Lord God. But you trusted in your own beauty, played the harlot because of your fame, and poured out your harlotry on everyone passing by who would have it. I'm going to present to you an idea, and I think it's true, or I wouldn't be teaching it. Christ's competition in our hearts Well, the world and lust and money and pride. Yeah, all that's easy to see. We all, we can see that. We all know that. What we don't see so easily, and this is where Andrew Womack would say, man, you think failing is hard, you ought to try succeeding. It's tougher. It's tougher. The gifts, graces, blessings that become our focus and our desire could be even the best of things. So for me, I'm not a Christianity uh, basher. You know how I feel about the church and what God's doing everywhere. But I'm using that word Christianity as all the component parts that we busy ourselves with to be it and do it and be it right. Is it Christ or is it Christianity that owns our passion and inflames our hearts? Christianity, living the Christian life, can become, and I'm speaking from experience, so absorbing, so occupying, that we can play the harlot and Jesus has slipped out of the picture and we don't even know it. Paul said, for me to live is Christ. Very simple, huh? Not a complicated life. For me to live is Christ. Idolatry, that word fills the Bible. Have you ever been curious about that? You know, a handful of times where uh, the Bible will talk about, you know, for water baptism, that kind of thing. We have a handful of scriptures, and I believe in it. I believe it's important. But the idea of idolatry or worshiping false gods and that kind of thing, 
at least my count this week, over 500 times. Over 500. Wipes out many other major doctrines we have. But why? Because, I mean, how many people do you know have a little hunk of something that they worship in their house? I think, God, you must have known at the end times you know, that that would be totally irrelevant to us. All those scriptures, why waste my time with them? But it fills the Bible. Any good thing, even coming from God, that competes with Jesus for my affection, passion, and desire is idolatry. Where is Jesus on my passion meter in my heart? Really? Do any of the best things that even come from him, because they were made by him, do they replace him? He did for Israel. That was his stuff that made her look good. Have you ever healed somebody and you knew you looked good? Have you ever had God use you and you don't know if anybody else was impressed but you were? <laughs> wow. Ding, ding, ding. I have been, I think, without seeing it, idolatrous. Any destiny, calling, ministry, or cause, even the best, best, best of them, even those that God sent to us with prophecy and angelic encounter, any part of our Christianity that doesn't flow out of relationship with Him is sustained by relationship with Him, leading into more relationship with Him, isn't real. It's an idol. If it's not God-made, it's man-made. And if it's not relationship-made, it's not God-made. You see a woman in the street, and she's carrying this little doll, and, and she thinks it's a baby, and just out of compassion, you want to say, ma'am, that's a doll. It's not a baby. She doesn't know it. That's what God's doing to the Corinthian church. In the Old Testament, more than once God would say, look, you cut a hunk of wood and threw half of it in the fire, and the other one you made a god to worship. And he said, it's a chunk of wood. It's dead wood, folks. Why are you worshiping that? And uh, I think he could talk to, I, I mean, good Christians that are faithful and serving. I think they're... And he's not saying these are bad things. They're all good things. Resisting the devil, that's a good thing. Authority, that's a good thing. Confessing, that's a good thing. Resisting all doubt, that's... You know, it's all good stuff. But that doesn't lead us to Jesus. It comes out of Jesus. And I want to do all those things, but I find out I can do them better when I'm flowing with him. Now, close with this idea. How are we doing? Okay? You're doing great. Oh. <laughs> Mona's idea. Very few things give me as much encouragement as the Laodicean church, believe it or not. Flesh based, carnal, lukewarm, tepid bunch of Christians, I go. There's hope. The Bible says in uh, Revelation 3 that God loved them. He said, I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't love you. It's not a question of love. They just triggered God's gag reflex. It's not, not that he did. I love you, but I'm having a hard time stomaching this. They were people who had Jesus inside their hearts, but they loved everything else more than him. And then in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door. See, there are people like the ones on the wrong side of the mountain saying, man, I am rich and I'm this and I'm well clothed. And I'm. And God says, you don't know that you're poor, blind, and naked. You don't know it. <sighs> Behold, and this is his solution. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him and have a business meeting with him and he with me. Isn't it nice that God's intent in approaching you personally and deeply is not to discuss the next event 
that you're supposed to accomplish on his behalf. I want to come in and eat with you. <laughs> Planted inside each one of us, permanently based in our core, is the relationship instigator, motivator, navigator, culminator. He was planted inside of us for one primary reason, to be our relationship educator, applicator, tour guide. Revealing Jesus. That's the Holy Spirit's number one job. Revealing Jesus. He's the dinner bell. We're all Laodicean Christians in our flesh. Every one of us. And we're all in process, processing out of that. To walk consistently in harmony with God is not only hard, it's what? It's not only hard, it's impossible. But here's the secret to it all. That pesky, non-stopping, all of our life knocking that goes on inside of there. Oh, that's just my flesh. Your flesh will not tell you, come fellowship with God. Anything knocking in your heart saying, God's here and I will meet with you. If you want to have food with me, let's eat. That's not the flesh. That's the, you can count on the fact, that's the Holy Spirit. The voice on the inside so we recognize it, we hear the voice. See, it's right now. If you just turn your attention and listen, turn a spiritual ear in that direction, you'll hear it right now. And we respond to it, we open the door. We recognize, we respond, so it knocks. I recognize and I respond. Knocks again, I recognize and I respond. And that goes on daily if I'll let it. My point being, it doesn't take... Now, I, I believe it's good for us to have... Uh, quality time with God to help anchor all the relationship on the run thing. But your relationship with God is not going to happen in a room in that set of hours. It's a life. It's a marriage. It's not a, it's not a conjugal right thing. It's a marriage. And that happens uh, in your car. That happens at your work. Relationship with God doesn't necessarily take a closet. It just takes recognizing, hearing the voice because the Holy Spirit is the one that makes it happen and responding, opening up. And when you, when you sense that, oh, I would like to have some fellowship with Jesus, maybe you might lo look up a scripture. That's your way of responding at the moment. Or pray in the Spirit. Or you might sing a little song. Or maybe at some time you might just look up to heaven and smile. You might do that. And every little single response we give to that thing calling us into relationship takes us a step closer to knowing the real Jesus better and better and better. Now listen, he is power. And whenever we respond to anything initiated by the Holy Spirit, power comes to enable our response. Let me say that again. Anytime we're responding to the Holy Spirit, He won't watch us in our emptiness try to accomplish something we can't. Power comes to enable us to do so. It's His work, not ours. Well, it sounds like work. You don't know the Holy Spirit. It's His work, not ours. It's His power, not ours. It's our recognition. It's our response. That's about all we put into this. And as we simply respond today, oh, you're here. Tomorrow, oh, hi, Jesus. I love you. What, through your day, the relationship is growing stronger with Jesus. And then to our surprise, we find ourselves becoming filled with wisdom and power that we weren't even looking for. Freed from fake, false wisdom and power of the flesh that the Jews and Greeks are desperately pursuing. But we've found that what we were searching for
is Jesus himself, who is himself, in himself, by himself, God's wisdom and power. Amen. Let's stand up.